with the incredible support from the Goethe Institute, Bangalore, Goethe Institute, Max Mullapav in Bangalore. And um, I particularly wish to thank um, its director, Michelle Hines and uh, Maureen Gonsalves and other members of the staff. Without their support, this biennial would not have been possible. And I also wish to thank all our other partners, funders, patrons, artists, and above all, you, the audiences and the viewers who have, been, who have been joining us and supporting us throughout the festival. So now, without much, much ado, I now invite Professor Sundar Sarukai to chair this evening's conversation on archiving practices of performance and introduce our um, presenters from Germany. Over Thank you. Sundar. Thank you, Jay. Um, Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to have all of you here today. And uh, it's a continuing conversation which started, it's been going on for a few weeks. We had one specific conversation two weeks ago on February 5th, 
which was on the future of performance. We had um, Urmimala, Sarkar, Preeti, Atreya, and Nicole, along with Jay. And it was a very interesting session where we talked a lot about how both practitioners and scholars view the future of performance itself, not just because of the pandemic, but of various other changing dynamics around the world. And uh, in continuation, I would think in the, in, in the continuation of this conversation, um, within the context of a future of performance, we are today going to deal with one of the most important, but much less discussed aspect of archiving in arts. And I, I'm really glad that we are having this opportunity to have uh, three very well-known archivists joined with one of the most important uh, uh, traditional artists from India, Usha Nangia, who is also doing a very important archiving project now. So it's really remarkable that with or, or uh, with the already well-known archival um, impulse present in Atakali for a very long time, along with these examples which we'll be talking today, it brings the spotlight on archiving. And I look at archiving as an extension of the future of performance question, because uh, you know, people tend to look at archives as something about the past, but it's so much about the future. It's so much about how we imagine the past in the future. We imagine the present in the future. So uh, in continuation of this extension of future of performance, placing this question of archive within that, we are really delighted that we'll have uh, two long sessions, but I'm sure that they'll be worth every minute of your time. So we have broken today's session into two parts. The first one is about the Pina Bosch archive, and there is going to be a lot of conversation about it. It also opens up ways in which we can imagine and conceive of archiving in arts in general, and particularly in dance. And that's going to, uh, we will start, uh, it will probably go about uh, one and a half hours, so we may go on till 6.30. And um, that we'll, we'll first have a presentation by the uh, two of the archivists, then Venkat here will have a conversation with them. And uh, Urmi Mala Sarkar, who is joining us online, who was with us physically two weeks back, and Jay will have some immediate response to that. And after that, we are we will be open for questions from the audience. Uh, then we will have a break. We'll hopefully stop this at about 6.30 or so. We'll have a break about five or so minutes where you'll be served coffee for those of us who are here. And then we'll have Usha Nangia's session with her presentation and then an open discussion amongst all of us here. So um, I'm really looking forward to a very exciting evening. And I hope um, you will be able to raise your questions and comments and uh, you know whatever else you want to share with us during the open discussion session that will follow. So yeah. Those who have, um... hello. Those who have um, assembled here, I also wish to say, after the, both the presentation and the discussion, that we will also have a reception downstairs with um, some wine and uh, drinks. And please do join us. This is um, uh, organized by Goethe Institute and Article. Thank you, Jay. I think that will also help us continue the conversation more informally, will inspire more conversation. Uh, and for those of uh, our speakers who are not with us to join us on this, we will think of all of you while we do that. Um, so today, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, our speakers to today. Um, Ishmael Dia started working for the Pina Bosch Foundation in 2011. He has been director of the Pina Bosch Archive since 2017. Uh, Julian Klotz has been developer, front and back end of the Pina Bosch archives since 2019. And they will be uh, presenting, uh, giving their presentation first. And Venkat Srinivasan, who is here with us, he will be in conversation with them. And Venkat is an archivist at the Archives, National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. He also serves on the review boards for the archives at IIT Madras, ISI Kolkata, and NID, the National Institute of Design. Additionally, he's an independent science writer whose work has appeared in the Atlantic Scientific American Nautilus Aeon Wired at the Caravan. It's a pleasure to have him with us, visit Tata Kalari and be with us physically today. So may I now invite, um, I'm sorry, before I finish, the two people who will respond after the conversation will be uh, Professor Urmimala Sarkar Munsi, who was, as I said, with us very well known uh, a scholar of uh, dance, performer and uh, scholar. She's a faculty at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. 
Her specialization is in critical dance studies, visual anthropology, and ethnographic research. And of course, Jay Chandran Pallari is a founder and artistic director of Artakari Center for Movement Arts. He is an internationally acclaimed dancer and choreographer at the forefront of the contemporary Indian movement art scene. So they will have some response after the conversation, and then we'll open it out for discussion. May I now uh, invite Ismail and Julian to present there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we are really happy. It's a bit early for us to have a wine, so we will be with you in, a, in our thinking. Um, first of all, I wanted to just thank uh, with a warm heart, uh, Atakalari, Jay, for this invitation and allow us to present our work. And also, I would like, like you, Jay, to thank you, to thank uh, the Goethe Institute, because Goethe Institute has been a, a really huge support for Pina's work over the years, over the world. Uh, it has make, made possible to promote her work and for almost 14 pieces, uh, the Goethe Institute has, has been a really, really strong partner. So thank you, Michael Ernst. Thank you, his team. And thank you, the Goethe Institute in general. So I wanted to start with that. Um, in a few minutes, I will do, uh, in a few moments, I will do a, a presentation about uh, our archive. But I don't want to make today a promotion of our work because it's accessible now online and you are very welcome to make your experience and to give us some feedback if there are problems, something you, you don't understand, something are, are not working. We have a contact uh, formula and you, you are very welcome to, to write to us because we are in the face, we are online uh, since November from last year. So it's really relatively new and we are still working on it. So uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, I will start this presentation with a small uh, background, who we are, where we come from, what is the foundation, and then what is the archive, and go a bit in detail what we do in the archive. And afterwards, uh, I will uh, give the word to Julian, who will present the background of this archive on, on a more technical way. So you have the idea what is to build an archive from a performing art for a choreographer, for a life work of Pina Bausch. And that's what we are trying to do. So I will start my presentation. And I hope you can see. Can you see my, my screen now? Yes. So about the Pina Bausch Foundation. Um, the Pina Bausch Foundation was founded by Salomon Bausch, the son from, of Pina Bausch, after she died in uh, June 2009. So the foundation was created in August 2009. And uh, we have the task to protect, preserve uh, Pina's choreographic and artistic heritage alive and to bring it in the future. To bring in the future, that's, it means make the work accessible through the archive, but also on stage. We are, the foundation is doing many, many projects in restaging some pieces. We have been working with dancer from many countries of Africa to restage the Rikers Springs. They are currently traveling in, uh, in Australia. We have been working with uh, opera, opera companies uh, around Europe to do some, some pieces, Rikers Spring, but Cafe Muller. So it's not only about archiving, it's the process of preserving the work and making, keeping it alive. So, and of course, with Stans Theater, who is still existing and performing the repertoire of Pina's pieces. Oops. So uh, just for, as an information, uh, Pina Bausch came three times in India with uh, 
so with many pieces, but she, she came in uh, 1979 for the first time in India. And then she came in 94 with Carnation, Nelken, this piece, and they went to Madras, Kolkata, Delhi, Mumbai. And uh, the latest uh, visit was in 2008 with her, her piece, Bamboo Blues. So um, she has had a, a strong relationship with India. Uh, and a few names come in my mind, like Chandraleka, uh, Savitri Nair, Shantala uh, <laughs> uh, Shivalingapa, so, but uh, and she invited a lot of artists when she did some festival in Wuppertal. So it's uh, yeah. Uh, so about the archive, and uh, I chose this photo because it's not what an archive is looking like. Uh, it's a work. Uh, the work table of Pina when she, when we are stole. So uh, I really like this photo. It's, uh, it's saying a lot. And a few of the documents on, on the table are in the archive now. Um, the idea of, of an archive came from Pina herself. So she wanted that everything in relation to a piece, the show Bible, the poster, the costumes, the stage lights and technique uh, documentation, the props, the videos to be covered and reviewed. So she had asked Dancer to do this, to, to start with this process. Uh, among them, Benedict Billet, Barbara Kaufman, Joanne Endicott, who has been who have been in the company for a really long time, and they starting really processing the material and and starting sorting out what there is. In, in the in the office from Tanzata, and there was a huge amount of material. So, and Pina Bausch Foundation uh, started to archive in 2010 material, uh, and a lot of material was digitized, if possible. So, physical objects were measured, photographed, described, etc. So, um, in our data bank. Data bank, uh, we have entries amounting um, 1,600 persons. There are uh, 53 pieces, uh, and among them, the 47 with the Tanz Theater, because uh, the archive of the Pina Bausch Foundation is not only focusing on the work of Tanz Theater, but before Pina made some pieces before. So she started, started a choreographic work with some pieces. And um, we have, there has been around 4,500 performance in our career. So we have a lot of programs. We have over 300,000 photos and we have listed 300 venues, 200 cities, 50 lands, 4,500 costumes. So, and our work is, to try to really uh, take this information, and Julian will say a bit more about that later, and to give every document an ID and try to, to take the information to be, to be able to, to relate the material between, uh, between them. In 2011, we started uh, working with the Darmstadt University. So it's a University of Applied Science in Darmstadt. And uh, with Bernard Toul, who has been a, a consultant for us, working for us about this link data idea. So link data, uh, Julian, will, you will say a few words about it. Huh? So, this is a few examples of uh, material we have. We have negatives, we have photos, we, have, we are photographing the photos, and in detail, we are annotating the photos. It means every person related to the dance theater have an ID, and we, of every photo we can, we try to, to collect the faces, the names, so afterwards, you can use this information to relate a photo to a piece, a photo to a, a, big, a, a big gathering of photos for a person, for example. 
for a place for a time. So those are the examples of the video we have in archive. And the videos are almost all digitized. Uh, and it was about time because from some material they were starting to to, re to be really in bad shape and not to be used again. And for the video, we are also annotating videos. So we are annotating the title that Pina gave to scenes. We are annotating the music. We are annotating the people. So it relates also to the photos when some people are in a video and we have information about the date of a video and a person and a place and a piece. So you can relate everything together. We have a lot of manuscripts, and this is a good example of uh, it's from a piece, so a creation of a piece, and uh, it's a, a lot uh, handwriting from Pina with a small notes, and it's a really um, it's really a big work to digitize it because it's like a puzzle. So you can take it off because there are layers of information and we are still thinking of the best way to to make it accessible without losing the nature of this document so i took a program that we have in our archive so i think it's related to the the place and the, the time today it was from a, from the performance in a i think it was Mumbai, yeah, I don't know, but from Bamboo Blues, uh, one of the last piece from Pina. We, we did a huge work of uh, taking photo of all the costumes and uh, information. You can see uh, that of our website and we are linking the costume to a piece, linking the costume to a, a dancer who wore these costumes. So a lot of uh, information can be found and those information are also used to restate the piece when when we want to make a piece with, a, with another company and they have to do the costume new again it's a it's a, an important source of information so here yeah, is the setting for costume shooting we are also doing because we are also generating documentation because uh, it will, and I think it will be the second part on, on of our conversation. Uh, what what gets lost in a in an archive from performing arts, and a lot of the information are embodied in the body of the dancer, in their memories, and we are trying to have conversation with a lot of dancers. So we started last year. Uh, it's a really long process, and we have a lot of interview to to make but to, to get them to speak about their experience, their memories. Um, so you can see on our website some of the interviews that, that we made about, we started with Café Müller, so all the people you can see on the screen danced in Café Müller, but you will see it's quickly opening to a, a wider experience to work with Pina over the years. And, uh, it's a really binding factors uh, with the archive. So it's it's a denser archive. We can we cannot archive people, but we can get them to talk with us and and share their experience, which is really really important. So that this is a bit of a timeline from the work of Pina. As you can see, it starts in the sixties. To the 90s, it goes further, but I just wanted to show you an example and how the pieces in time uh, were played. And if you zoom, I won't zoom to, uh, now, but you can see where they were played. So you can see some, some art form pattern. And that's also inter interesting. And to us, what we want to do in the coming years, uh, months, is to include this time factor, so time from the past to the future. I wanted to, uh, to finish with this short overview of who we are and what we do to share with you some interesting link. 
uh, that are not from the Pina Bausch Foundation, but maybe you can find it interesting if you are working in, interested in making an archive. It's about uh, link jazz, link data, and the relation uh, between singer who met, who met who, who played with whom, and you can see, of, um, I think, a, a really visual structure. What is this link data? What is the what is its bring to, to link some information? There's also the second video is uh, with our partner from Aus der Kultur der Welt in Berlin. We made a congress uh, two years ago in Dresden, and there uh, the foundation uh, proposed with uh, Ricardo Viviani, Mark Wagenbach, Barbara Kaufman, a dancer, and Asusa Seyama to make a uh, real uh, transmission. So you will see two dancers, a dancer who created a role and bringing it to another dancer. And I particularly like this video because it shows the difficulty of archiving performing arts. It is something, you will see something that we are not capable of archiving for the moment. We can create a video from that, but it's a small extract of a piece, a two hour piece. There you have only a solo work. So it would be a huge amount of video time, uh, but you will see some, some complexity of the archiving of performing arts. And the third, I wanted to share with you this uh, motion bank. Uh, they were our partner when they developed a program that already existed, uh, Peacemaker, and to annotate an, 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 an to annotate videos. Sorry about that. Um, so what I show for 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 before what we use for for the video annotation. So please go and visit. There, it's really interesting what they are doing with performing arts and a live way to annotate um, a rehearsal or a show, a performance. Now we'll uh, give the word to Julian, and we will go and listen in the, the details of the archive. Thank you, Ismail, and hello, everybody. Thank you for having us today and inviting us to talk um, to you. And uh, I'll quickly start my screen sharing too. And you should be able to see. Whoop. Start. There we go. So let's go right to the beginning. Um, Ismail already introduced me. I'm Julian um, and I do the development work, software development work for Pina Bausch Foundation since 2019. And I can say it's quite a lot of fun. Um, and let's first talk before we deep dive into the te technology about the philosophy behind um, our cataloging and archiving practices. And uh, I think I, I, when I thought about picking a title, I thought we should talk about event oriented, uh, event oriented data. And uh, what I mean by event oriented is let's first go step back and talk about traditional archiving. So when you archive materials, let's say you have a photo, um, it's very common to pick uh, an object oriented approach. So you take a photo and describe it as thoroughly as you can. You describe the color tone, the material that was used, the support, its format size. Um, and this is very common for, let's say, archiving paintings. But this, uh, this is very short-sighted if you think about performing arts, because performing arts, they are not objects. Performing arts are immaterial, and uh, they, uh, they come into existence when uh, certain people meet at a certain time, at a certain place. And the orange thing right in the middle is th the thing that is most interesting to us that we would like to capture somebody's painting <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so i can't skip my slide anymore sorry what's going on somebody um, took over 
Did somebody take over my screen? Sorry for that. Let's maybe, have a quick maybe, break. Uh, maybe come back to your, your stop sharing and start sharing again. Uh, I'll try, but I can't see my mouse cursor anymore. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, so now we should be back. Um, just recently and start again and hit play. So we should be back. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so what, what's interesting for us is when uh, people meet at a certain place at a certain time, and this is where perform, uh, this is how performances, festivals, and um, also events in the biography of people take place. And what we have in our archives is mostly we have recordings and kinds of capturings of these moments um, where performances take place. So we, we cannot really archive performance, but we can have some kind of approximation by capturing video photos, by collecting the news reporting and, um, and making sense of this. And if you take away one thing from this talk, uh, discussion today is don't think about objects too much. The objects are just artifacts. Think about the events and people and their memories too, but because this is what really is um, the essence of performing arts. And uh, this is why we picked an event-oriented approach to modeling our data. This cloud you can see here uh, shows all works by Pina Bausch, the pieces she created um, during her active period, and uh, the people who were related to it. And um, frankly, this part of the data is much more interesting to us um, than, say, a single photo. And uh, this is about the philosophy uh, of the cataloging and um, digitization approach of the Pina Bausch archives. So now let's, let, uh, let's get to the more concrete technical part. Um, we started back in 2009. And um, again, I can't, uh, again, I can't see my mouse and my screen. So this should do. Um, So I'll just try to show you this way. I'm sorry for that, but it should do too. So we started um, in 2009 by creating lo lots of spreadsheets and uh, we used Excel, the Microsoft thing, um, to catalog the metadata um, that we, we had from our photos and videos and press clippings and posters and just put it inside Excel spreadsheets. So um, this took us very far. And um, in a research project with uh, the University of Applied Sciences in Darmstadt, um, they created software that was able to read the Excel files and uh, put it on kind of a website. Um, you should be able to see here. And it was a very basic um, way of browsing and uh, and looking at the data at the data that was captured in Excel, um, but Excel comes with a lot of drawbacks, um, especially when thinking about consistency in data. So it's very hard to keep a large data set um, in Excel and keep it consistent if you have your data spread around two hundred spreadsheets. So um, in two thousand and nineteen we started to move to a relational database and uh, took the tables and essentially imported them into a more formalized scheme um, that was easier to control and uh, where we could make sure that data um, is always consistent so that relations between objects are always intact and um, that we can avoid creating duplicate objects and uh, that helped us a lot but relational databases they are, if you're familiar with them, 
in a way also very unflexible. They are very formal and standardized, but also very unflexible. And uh, this is not quite what you need when you talk about this event-oriented model of looking at things um, and thinking about events instead of um, the mere objects. And uh, to support our relational database, we also added a linked data graph. And the linked data graph um, allows for a much more flexible modeling of the data you have. And uh, it creates this um, very, very interesting network um, of people, pieces, um, and how they are related to each other. So I don't know if it's large enough for you to see, but um, this is a piece Pina Bausch created. It's called Full Moon. And uh, you can see all the people who were involved in, in staging the piece um, in the world premiere. You can see uh, that somebody was on a picture and uh, it's linked to a picture and the picture is linked to its photographer and you get a very, very large network of uh, relations between the people, between the objects you have, um, between the pieces and the performing performances and the countries and the cities. So this becomes a very dense and interesting mesh of uh, information that we have. Um, but um, linked data... Sorry. Almost like a, a molecular view of the work, huh? of the yeah, so, so you have these very small units, and it's it it can be incredibly detailed, and uh, you can pretty much get any perspective that the data allows. And um, because both relational databases and also linked data graphs are very bad at uh, search, we added a third component relational database, link data graph, and a search engine. And um, what I mean by search engine is, imagine you have something like Google, but just installed for your own application um, and uh, just indexing the information you have in your archives. Um, and search engines are particularly good at um, things like fuzzy search. So um, you can have a typo in, in, in your search query and search will still work. They are very good and efficient at um, filtering information and narrowing information down if you want to look at a certain aspect. And uh, also sorting. So I think we wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to browse the archive with its thousands of entities without having a strong um, search engine um, backing the application. So these are our three main components for the archive application. And uh, this is essentially the, the, the technical part. And here's a little outlook and um, what we are aiming to do from a technical perspective. And uh, Ismail talked about it uh, before shortly. We want to focus on the temporal and um, also spatial dimension of the information we have um and let's first talk about seasons um what i mean by seasons is thinking about uh it's not thinking about um spring summer autumn and winter but seasons in the sense of 1973 season 1974 um, which very much structure the work of pina bausch and uh the, this could look like something like this. This is a quick mock I, I did, especially for the presentation, and it gives you an idea what I mean. Um, let's take season 1973, 1974, where um, one of Pina Bausch's first pieces, Fritz, was staged. And uh, we can create a view on our data that allows us to see the pieces that were relevant um, in this season, during the season. We can see the locations uh, that um, Pina Bausch and her company traveled. And we can also see uh, which dancers joined the company, maybe left the company. And we can even learn right at, right at the bottom that Matthias Burkert, who was um, responsible, responsible 
for lots of the music that was used in Pina Bausch's pieces started to study playing the trumpet in Wuppertal in 1973. So we can get, go very high level to very low level in this single view. And um, what is so exciting about this temporal dimension is that it creates a view on the data that we have that we didn't know before. And it creates a meaning that we didn't know about before. And th that is really the most interesting thing about um, this event-oriented approach of looking at the world um, because it will generate information for you that you could never think about and that wasn't present in your mind at all before uh, you did it. And this is also related to a, a piece that we call inferencing. It's about inferring information. So imagine you have a photo and you know this photo was taken by phot photographer Uli Weiss and uh, you know who's on the photo and maybe from the uh, from the stage you can see which piece was staged and just these bits of information you have about it maybe lets you infer information about when this picture must have been taken because we attempt to catalog um, who was in, in the company, who danced in the company, um, at which period of time. Um, we know which photographers were active for Pina Bausch. And uh, we know when the pieces were staged and it, it, allows, it, it allows us to um, yeah, infer information about the objects we have just by looking at other metadata. This is, I think it's, it's, it's very similar to the case with, with seasons. Um, because you can see, you can get new information um, that you couldn't think about before by just looking at the metadata that you have cataloged. And last but not least, it's also the very uh, it's also the most abstract point um, as a goal. But we attempt to make use of the data we have, and it really is harder than you think. We have an incredible level of detail. Um, because Pina Bausch always documented her work very thoroughly and our task is to make sense of it and that is really hard and uh, these are my my final words for the presentation um, and if you are curious feel free um, to take a look at the website uh, pinabausch.org and make your own little discoveries thank you um, do you have any questions that relate to the technical part? Thank you, it's my name, Julian. Um, it was a very comprehensive um, <clears throat> description of the archive. Of course, a very rich body of work of Pina Bosch. The very imagination that you can put it into archives itself must be daunting. And I can begin to see the contours of what you have tried to do. And I'm very fascinated by, by it. And I'm sure there are many questions uh, which our audience will have and our experts, Urmimala and Jay, will also address to you after, um, you know, Shankar, I mean, sorry, Venkat has his conversation with you. I just um, wanted to, before opening it up for the conversation, I think there are many important points about performance itself that are being raised in this, uh, you know, in their presentation. What does it even actually mean to archive a performance as compared to archiving certain other kinds of events? And to me, uh, you know, I found there are very interesting uh, questions. I mean, well, some couple of things which we may want to think about further is this reduction of events into data, an enormous amount of data. What does it actually mean? Who is, so in, in another way to put it, uh, I think there are some of the questions we might want to think about larger questions of archive and Venkat might be able to help us understand it better. Uh, it raises the question, who is the archive meant for? Who are your potential audience? You know, if archiving itself is a performance, who are the ones who are going to be interacting with it? Who is, who is going to be, have, what kind of competence do you need? In a sense, let me put it this way, you know, something which we do often and I teach my courses, what does it mean to read an archive such as yours? Okay, and that is to me an important point I want to come back to because it speaks to what performance itself means. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome Winket to continue the conversation with you. And after the conversation, we'll have the other two respondents and then open it up. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
Thanks, Mr. I, I hope you guys can hear me. Thank you. Actually, um, it's really quite an honor um, to be in the company of people I admire and respect. I hope. Sorry. No? Okay. I will try and speak louder. Okay. Hopefully that helps. No? Okay. I'll just do this. Um, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, as I said, I, it is an honor um, to be around people that I truly admire and respect. Um, and I have to say, uh, Julian and uh, Ismail, I'm uh, in awe of what you guys have done. Um, it's uh, as someone who also, you know, constructs or helps construct archives, I understand the the amount of meticulous work that has gone behind this. And I think meticulous is the word that comes to mind. I've had the occasion to browse through your website uh, over the last uh, many days, and um, it's extraordinary. But at the same time, I realized that maybe it's you know, what you left off us with, uh, Julian, the question that you'd asked us to say, you know, what the future goals are, in a way for me is also what the goals of the archive have always been in a sense, sort of an aspiration that what is the purpose of an archive? And you, you said that you want to sort of go towards a space where you can make sense of data. And Sundar alluded to this as well. Um, the, the ICA, the International Council on Archives, has a declaration um, that says, I think if I'm not mistaken, it says archives record decisions, actions, and memories. And I think that's, that, that sort of starting phrase is accurate. Um, it, but it, it conceals within it what Julian has sort of succinctly described saying, you know, we're, we're in this business to sort of make sense of what's happened. Um, so one thing uh, I have to say, of course, that I'm not from the field of the performing arts. I am an archivist at this point. And so one parallel that I saw as I was looking through the material um, was uh, this, this battle of looking at context and process. When we think of um, archives, one of the things that we focus on is to sort of hopefully capture the context and process of the things, the people, the events, as you uh, rightly described, uh, the corporations, the families, whatever it is that they're archiving. Um, these two words matter a lot um, in the world of archiving. I'm curious to know, as you did this work, what difficulties did you see um, since you perhaps know of the actual context and process, or maybe you know people who work with you? What, what do you think was difficult in actually um, entering the archive um, from the perspective of context and process? Uh, does, that, does that question make sense? I'm sorry, I should be looking at you guys here. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. First of all, I, I would like to add that context are uh, really important for us. And in, uh, in all those years, as we catalog, uh, we are trying to put of the arch archive material some context. Is it a rehearsal? Is it a creation process? Is it a, a restaging of a piece? So, and also Ricardo, who is also with, uh, with us today, I see him. Uh, in the interview, we are trying to put some context and we have to organize them and the way it is built, we will be about, uh, allowed or we could uh, in the future create some contextual uh, bubbles around uh, a piece. So where it comes from, what is the material associated with that, how it was made and maybe how it's uh, still evolve in the future. But I think the very um, flexibility of the system we have in behind will allow us through inferences, as Julian said, or through uh, curated for, uh, post from us with the knowledge of the dancer, with a, because we are working constantly with the dancer to take some information without, without them to choose videos to, to put in front of our archive website to, to rebuild a, a complete performance with archive material wouldn't be possible. So uh, maybe gives a, a beginning of an envelope, uh, an answer to what you, you're asking. Yeah, all right. So, okay. I mean, one aspect, I suppose, I think we, we briefly had a chat about this earlier, um, which is to sort of think about the dimensionality and you know, think about all the different dimensions that exist in a given moment. Um, but the archive, in a sense, you know, we could think of the archive, I mean, most people, when they enter the archive, 
uh, today, perhaps, if they're not from the field, think of the archive as being exhaustive, um, mm -hmm. as being quote unquote complete. Um, and of course, uh, that's never the case. Um, other, uh, when, when you think of this uh, work that you're doing, especially in linked data, and maybe it's some context, uh, Julian might be useful more uh, for all of us to sort of give some uh, flavor of uh, what you described earlier about the transition from object oriented to event oriented data. Um, do you think this will take us in, in a realm where the archive can be constantly reimagined and constantly recategorized, resorted to, to get to a point where you are able to see all those multiple dimensions of a given moment um, that happened prior to this, um, uh, the archive? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about linked data is not, uh, not only that it's incredibly incredibly flexible, um, but there are also um, standard data formats for archiving um, data from cultural heritage. And uh, this allows us to essentially very easily exchange the data we have on and to apply it um, to any kind of research project that we um, may that we may um, hmm, that we may have with other organizations. Um, and uh, we used to have a project, um, Ricardo Viviani, that uh, uh, Ismail just mentioned was also involved, where uh, three German archives um, that all are related to performing arts um, built something together from their joint um, data sets. And uh, this flexibility that linked data gives us um, is, is just an invitation to use the data we have for any kind of project, for any kind of research, maybe for installations and exhibitions, and uh, and anybody can use it because it's uh, we keep it in a very standardized way. So you can always and every day reimagine what you do with it, just by putting together the right queries um, and thinking about uh, the right questions. So. I hope this kind of answers your your question. Yeah. Um, sorry about that, Julian. Yeah, it made sense. Uh, but this 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 sort of really complicates some things, right? So when I look at the archive itself. Uh, and very often, you know, people who come to us ask, well, you know, who's the archivist? And I sort of try and tell them that, in a sense, the archivist is, the, the proto-archivist is the creator of the material. In this case, um, Pina Bausch is sort of, you could think of her as the proto-archivist. And then um, you've come along and you made this, some decisions of what enters the archive. And of course, uh, very often we don't realize that one of the primary jobs of an archive is erasure, not preservation. Um, whether we like to say it or not, there's, there's, there's an active act of erasure saying that this will not enter the archive. And mm -hmm. um, you, you don't know what you don't know. And so the, the future doesn't necessarily know what decisions you've, you've made unless you sort of describe it in your, in your finding aid. But I mean, maybe the other question as, as we go towards this relationship model, this event-oriented approach that you've talked about is to sort of see what is, what is that line between curation and archive then? Um, or you know the chicken egg question that is perennial of what comes first, the curator or the archivist. Um, I, I don't know if you want to take a shot at that, uh, especially you know when for instance you know I was looking at your, your your categorization, which is just very just very imaginative and thoughtful, right? You know to to sort of decide that you're going to look at venues as a, as as a way of sorting, to look at costumes as a way of sorting, and use that as the point of departure to get us to understand the different artists who are connected to. Um, a piece of fabric effectively, right? Or, or a geographical space and see the different people or different stories that are affected, you know, connected to different space. But what you're doing in a sense I see is you're, you're creating this middle space, the in-between space between the traditional archive and the produced story or the performance. And, you know, it connects to, you know, Sundar's question early on about the archive being performative in its own ways. So I, I just wanted to get a sense from you about this, this line between the curator and the archivist, if there is a line. Yes, um, I think you're right, there is one. And actually, what you can see on our website is not the final archive. We have way more documentation 
Uh, as we talked last time, I told you an example. We have from for Cafe Muller above two, 250 uh, recordings. And for, for many reasons, we couldn't put them on the online archive for rights reason. So it's a, it's a choice. But what we, we put online, it's around 20 videos from Cafe Muller. It's, it shows uh, in time uh, a piece and how it evolves with different actors, with different dancers different locations so it gives it gives an idea it's not the archive idea because if you want you can come to us and you can take a few months and look at all the performances but i i don't think anybody is able to see the 300,000 photos so for that we are we are really orientated with the performance the choice of the video um, I did not make a loan, so I, I make some proposition and I talk with, to, for example, for Café Muller, Dominique Merci, who is performing for, for the, who was a member of the company for the creation of Café Muller until 2016 or 18, he danced. So he has, he has in his body, in his memory, uh, knowledge, what's, what represent the piece over the years. So, Yes, it is curated, and I, I, I agree with you, but in another way, in the archive, we try to have everything uh, catalogued and everything uh, there. And we have the chance that PINA started organizing the archive. So we developed uh, working on the base she settled for the archives. You know, these, these categories didn't come from us. We took over and we developed that. So maybe it's a curated archive, but the origin of that is the creator herself. So. And we have, but, I can keep going on. This is, I mean, you never get two archivists to speak to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, the question that you raised is, uh, it's really an, an important one. And just yesterday, we had a, a quite a long discussion about what happens um, if a piece is staged and the photographer comes to us and hands us over 5,000 photos of one performance. What are we going to do? And uh, it really is hard because um, materials are constantly added to the collection. And uh, the pieces by Pina Bausch are being restaged at the moment by the Pina Bausch Foundation, and we will continue continue to do so. So we have at the moment an ever growing um, catalog of materials, and uh, to to be frank, we are struggle, struggling and finding out what to do with it <laughs> because it's just so much. And uh, you also have to think about who's your audience and what are we going to do uh, going to put in the into the archives management system, though we, so we have the data, and which part of the data are we going to publish? And uh, you want to be both an archivist by archiving the information you have, um, but you also want to provide a good experience for visitors of, of your archive, and um, therefore select the materials that you want to show. And uh, it's not always easy to answer, and yeah. it's really hard to get it right. And maybe I, I wanted to add that for the restaging, um, so the restagers are coming in, into the archive, they are watching some material and they are gathering material. That it means inside a collection of material, we have specific collection for the work that people they say, okay, I want this video because it's good for the light. I want this video because of the formation and the group are really good. I want this video because the solo at the end or in the middle or at the beginning is good. So I want this video because uh, the, the set was good done, the music, the cues are really right. And we, we add all this information and it gives us a small package of information. So, and we have that maybe for the regular audience because some some restager they want to see a, a long shot of a video that nobody uh, 
Today, we would like to look to our video a long shot because it's not used. So we have to constantly make choice according to whom, uh, to whom is it. But we try to stay wide to show off. But this is an archive. We are not doing uh, only um, high resolution uh, materials. Sometimes it's from the 70s uh, with a camera moving like this or a photo that are not um, artistic quality, but it has something inside. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to sort of lay out one broad question and then we'll have a broader discussion, of course, after this. And this connects two things that both of you said um, right at the beginning, um, Ismail, you, you talked about, you know, the, the puzzle of this work. And I think this, this word is, is, is very apt because I guess as archivists, one of the, at least the thing that I love about this process is the, the puzzle solving, trying to make sense, trying to constantly contextualize and uh, figure out what are the little things that tie uh, together. And that to me sort of closely tied to something else that you said, Julian, towards the end, which where you talked about those three circles, the, the intersecting Venn diagram of sort of people, place and time. Um, I, I bring this sort of connection up because there are so many archives and of course the, the digital realm, which we haven't touched upon at all, has enabled, you could argue, a variety of different kinds of archives to grow that are not necessarily the, the traditional top-down archive. There are lots of uh, grassroots movements of archives, of disciplines, of themes, of um, um, uh, ways of thinking, if I may. But You've, you've been very particular in the choice of the word, essentially, right? I mean, it's called the Pina Bausch archive. It's, 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 it is an archive of, of a person looking back at everything related to an individual. You know, there, there could have been a choice that you would have made about whether this is an archive of uh, a form of expression, is it an archive of a season? You know, so those are other ways, but there's that, you know, in a sense, there's a certain uh, being faithful to, this, uh, to the idea of the archive, which is that it, it captures everything around the, pe the people who created the archive, in this case, Pina Bosch. Um, this people place time intersection that you had described towards the end for me is, is I think, in a, a good point to sort of launch into a broader conversation because when we think of, say, an archive of, um, uh, of a particular discipline, let's say an archive uh, um, of a particular uh, form of movement or um, a particular form of music, uh, what do you think? might be the challenges in using the current traditional approaches of the archive, um, which is the object-oriented approach. Um, would you see in your work, do you see the sort of branching out into something broader um, to say that it's, it's going to be an archive around a particular discipline or uh, those are the kinds of things that I want you to sort of maybe discuss if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will start by saying, um, actually, it's a big challenge, but it gives us a big freedom to be uh, an, an archive from one artist. Uh, and I just wanted to quote what, what a dancer said as Pina started uh, the selection process for material. She asked, uh, please find material that is nice. And I don't know if, if it's a really archivist uh, question. And the, the fact that she brings this artistic, this, uh, the emotional in archive, it's really complicated and interesting. So I, I just wanted to start uh, with, uh, with that. So tempted to ask you something about that, but I need to hold off. Um, <laughs> thank you so no, much. No, ask, uh, ask it, please, so please. Have that in conversation with everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, Mankit, uh, for this conversation, um, and for the response by Ismail and Julian. Uh, let me um, call upon Professor Vodhanimala Sarkar for her comments, um, and then, of course, Jay, <coughs> open it up. Vodhanimala. Hi, it's wonderful to be back with you guys, but it's disappointing not to be there. And thank you for calling me. And uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I have grown up uh, as a dancer, uh, viewing and admiring Pina. So this is like a kind of jewelry box opening in front of me. And while I was visiting the archive yesterday and day before, I really had a lovely time. Thank you. 
So um, the, my, my question and also comment is mm. that many people, many dancers, especially of that particular period who danced at the same time as Bina mm. and could also choreographed at that mm. time have mm. had great amount of resistance to archives or archiving. And as a result, we see a lot of disappearance in the sense that videos, like you say, that they have started to go bad. Here, we see many videos which have gone bad, which have gone beyond repair. And then we see, um, you know, a kind of what, what Sundar was saying in the beginning, that there's an archival impulse that you are talking about of Pina, who constantly documented, who kept things and who um, asked people to contribute, uh, who asked photographers to photograph and also mm. encouraged people to make that, create that uh, repertoire of material. But I was thinking that uh, what was her um, uh, views regarding what this material would do in the later times? What would its work be? It, was there anything that she uh, kind of envisioned as the future of this material? That's a really tough question. Um, so I, I will start with, with the beginning. With Dance Theater, uh, Dance Theater is one of uh, the company who has been working with video really early. And they recorded uh, really a lot. So the rehearsal process, the creation process, sometimes the travel process, and the repetition of uh, a piece uh, in time. So I, th I think it was part of a daily workflow. So to look at the video and sometimes the day after a performance to look at the video and make corrections. So it, it has been part of a, a daily process. Uh, and it's really difficult to me to talk about Pina's vision about the future of this material because I, I've never worked with her closely. Uh, and I, I wouldn't dare to, to, to make her say what I think, but it's not the truth. So. But I see that in, in a lot of the archival uh, material that we have in the archive, there are some traces of Pina watching it. There are some comments of, of the, the assistant. Uh, Pina finds this is a good uh, performance. Or on the choice of the photo, why is it uh, good? Why is it uh, valid? I don't know, but we, you, we have some, uh, some traces that Pina mm -hmm. showed the material and find good. What we put online lately is a selection of photo for the photo material, for example. We had huge boxes from all the pieces that Pina gathered and put this photo in these boxes. So we started, we, we were thinking, okay, what do we start with? Of course we start with that, but we don't know why are those photos put together in boxes. Uh, okay, that's, that's a very honest and a beautiful answer. And I, uh, I think I was kind of uh, touched by the way in which, um, you know, um, you were talking about um, so many persons, then so many pieces, then programs, then 300,000 photographs, 450, uh, 4,500 costumes and many other numbers. And I mm -hmm. was thinking that... Um, what would the, I mean, what would possibly be the future of this collection? Like, how would it help the dance community? The, the I know about academics. Like, I know the researchers would be, you know, overjoyed to work with this material over and over again. But whether would it would come into other um, bodies? Mm -hmm. Or how would it travel to other bodies? How it would be um, easier, whether it would be easier to reconstruct pieces um, mm -hmm. 
at later times and what would be the um, ways in which rights are given to people to kind of use this archive in future performances or would there be curbs about what you could do, what you couldn't do? Because there are serious, uh, serious issues of misuse that mm -hmm. one might want to think of. Yeah. We, we try to protect uh, what we put online, but of course, internet is a wild west, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but it's a choice. Uh, we could have kept that in, in our building and not show to anybody, but that's a bit egoistic. We take the risk, we put it online yeah. and share with a lot of people. And I find interesting what you said, because the archive, so what we have here in uh, our building, it's, it has been constantly in use for the last uh, 12 years since, since Pina passed away. It has been in use by Tanz Theater. They are profiting from what we digitize because it's a, it's a quicker access to the material. Um, we have been researching pieces uh, with, uh, the, for the children for yesterday, today, and tomorrow in Munich. Uh, with a uh, Paris opera, with uh, London, with uh, with uh, this wonderful project with the dancer of several uh, countries of Africa. Who, and for example, this project, it's the first time that we have, we have done a casting in, uh, in Senegal, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and another country. And we gathered some, some dancers from different Lens who didn't know the, the vocabulary of dance theater. And they have been, been working with experiment dancer to, to learn this vocabulary. And this exchange make shed a new light on the archive because they are seeing material, but they don't have the, the knowledge of dancer of dance theater or knowledge of uh, Paris or Opera. They know because we are close in a way. To, it's a small world, the dance world. And we wanted to break this chain and open to, to new possibility. And I think that's the way of the future. The foundation is currently working. I mean, not only the archive, but the foundation in general on a project about long-term existence of the artistic legacy of PINA. It means um, you, you have to question yourself. Uh, what is the work of the 70s today like? Uh, what is the right. piece today like or the, in the future to make? What is with the gender question? What is with all the, the evolution of the society? What makes a piece still... Uh, relevant? Relevant, yes. All of this kind of question, because if you have an archive, you have some, some markers in time, but... Uh, an artistic work keep evolving. You see it mm -hmm. when you see photos or video over 30 years, you see that it's like a stone that you polish. The, when the creator is still alive, the work evolves every day. So it's not a fixed component. And that's exactly. the, the, the question with Arthur, yes. And, and uh, I just wanted to finish this uh, thing by saying that you showed uh, something from Bombay, uh, Bamboo Blues, mm -hmm. uh, which had a title Ravindra Sadhan. It was being done at Ravindra Sadhan. That is in Kolkata. Kolkata. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I saw that performance there. So. And if you are looking in our website, I raised a question with Julian yesterday. We, we are fully aware that some of the city names change in history. Yeah, and, and it was Calcutta then. You know, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yes, and we are, we, this uh, time component, we will try to, to put it right. So formerly Calcutta or with the time, the name changed. We think we are thinking about it. I just wanted to, to make this small. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more thing to add, we would also like to invite everybody who has uh, watched pieces of Pina Bausch, maybe, uh, maybe in India, if you have any information, if you have dates and anything 
um, that I may contribute to the um, archives, feel free to email us. Um, we are more than happy to incorporate the information. Sure. But thank you for your question. Really interesting. Oh, thanks. I think you're on mute. Can't hear uh, Jeff. Yeah, we can't hear you. You can't hear? Yes. No. Now you can hear? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll just limit my um, to one question, uh, which we have a little bit discussed the other day. It's about, um, you know, you were talking about uh, these um, multiple dimensions, multiple coordinates about a particular event, time, place. No, we can't hear you. Can't hear. Oh. Can you hear? <laughs> You're back. Uh, is it uh, audible? Now it is fine. Now it is fine. Ismail, you can hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to ask about um, these multiple coordinates about an event or a, 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 in the uh, in the choreographic journey or in the practice of dance. Say, for example, uh, like we were mentioning about uh, the transfer of a particular work to either to Paris Opera or to uh, Ecole de Sable in um, Senegal, uh, mm -hmm. German Ag Agonis, um company. Um, so they are, I mean, Paris Opera may be a little bit closer, but uh, in the African context, it's very, diff very different kind of context. So if we imagine uh, the performative self as an archive, you know, the performative self itself becomes an archive. And how do you recreate that performative self? I mean, you have um, put together many conversations with the people who have participated in her, uh, in Pina Bar's work. Uh, you have uh, accumulated a lot of notes, a lot of uh, images, uh, um, uh, costumes, so on and so on and so forth. But how do we create this moment? Some of the dancers have said, I really thank Pina because have, she has seen me more intensely than myself in the rehearsal mm -hmm. because every day she's intensely watches. That's their comment. So I wonder how do we even begin to create that aspect? Is there any, any, uh, any possibility through link data or any of these arrangements? First of all, uh, I don't think so. Uh, the, the human component is really important. So uh, if, you, if you see a restager, he has to get, most of them dance with Pina, but some are learning and they have to learn to trust themselves within a work, to communicate things because uh, the archive and maybe the history can be sometimes really intimidating. Uh, but what, what I noticed with this project with L'Ecole des Sables um, is that people are trying ways that exist, but all are trying new ways to, to communicate the knowledge. And the more they go further with the project, the less they need archive support. It means at the beginning, some people want uh, an iPad or a, a hard drive with 5,000 videos, but at, at the end, they will use four. So, and that's an interesting uh, thinking process also. Um, and I, I wanted to come back to what we spoke earlier. It's a question that we have to raise for every piece. So, because learning right of spring or learning other piece where, that are really closer to the dancer identity, uh, it's different because 
maybe uh, uh, right of spring is more about the group it's more about the storytelling of the group uh, and other pieces like in the 2000 are more about individuality on stage so there's not a magic recipe i think i think we have to to sit and take time to think about that and maybe we think we start now to think and when we are done we have to do it again i don't know <laughs> Um, now let me open this up for some questions from the people who are here. Are there any of you who want to comment, ask questions, clarify something? You will have a mic. For the, if you put your hand up, they'll get you the mic. Do you hear me? Is the mic yes. working? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thanks, Ismail and Julian, for the very interesting presentation of the Pina Bausch archive. It was very interesting to hear, listen to you. My question refers to the point that you made that the archive is, of course, not only about the past, but also about the future. And um, that uh, we see that a seminal figure like Pina Bausch, of course, continues to inspire many dances, um, in, not only in Germany, but worldwide. You yourself just mentioned this project in Africa that had a connection to Pina Bausch's work. So my question is, how is the, does the archive allow uh, for this to be included uh, in some way? Um, or in other words, where do you draw the line on the artistic um, inspiration that is taken from Pina's work? In a sense, of course, a photograph uh, itself is already a kind of artistic engagement with Pina's work, and that is included in the archive. But what about performances that draw inspiration from her work? Is this also included, or is that even possible, or does it go too far from your point of view? Mm, in a way, it's, it's not too far, but we still have really much work to do with uh, Pina's work herself. So. We, are we have been concentrating on our work, but uh, um, there are some work already inspired by Pina, but maybe they will be um, added uh, to, the, to the collection. Or, or as Julian said, with this possibility to, to link with other uh, archive, other material, we will, it will be made automatically. But we are not close to inspiration. As long as there have been some case of uh, copying the work, that's a, that's a line. But inspiration, it's motivation. So uh, inspiration, some people are drawing, some people are, are photographing. We have, we have met people as we went to Palermo for the premiere of the film who said, that was the first piece I saw, and I, I became an actor seeing this piece. So it's inspiration. And as long as it makes possible uh, the encounters of any form of art, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful for us. It's wonderful. It's worth working on it. Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Um. If I can add something, I think uh, it's it's only a part of the story. But um, when we thought about uh, making the archives accessible to the public um, in in last November, we also thought about what's uh, what's the content of our website and what's the distinction between having the archives um, uh, online accessible. And having our website and uh, what we ended up with was just to build a combination of both so if you visit our website you can uh, see the dates of all upcoming performances as far as we know them at the moment uh, which is kind of covid related um, but you can also look into the past and it was very important to us um, to to have this to have past and future together and to link past and future together. And even if you look um, at, at uh, pieces that were staged 30 years ago for the first time, 
and uh, you will you can see if there are any upcoming events related to this piece and um, this is was our very well at the moment it's a very simple approach to bring past and future together um, but it was uh, logical to us because um, the archive is constantly evolving and uh, growing every day so and, and i think with the, the interview that we are doing with the dancer we have the 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 tense present because it's really interesting to see dancer some of them are not dancing anymore for a long time in the company but they are reflecting on the past work at the moment. So it's, and they have, have some other experience with other company or other line of works. It's really makes it interesting. Yeah. Well, there are two questions online, I was told. Um, how do we do this, Jay? Hi, Historia, so, you... uh, yeah, I'm here. We have a question from Marcus Wiesen. So Marcus Wiesen, if you're here, you can uh, discuss the question since it's pretty elaborate. Uh, hello, <laughs> do you hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, hi Jai, hi uh, Ricardo, hi all. Thank you for the wonderful talks. Uh, I, I had the chance to also hear Ricardo give a wonderful talk about your archive in Nice in, in November. And uh, my question is a bit in the line of uh, Dr. Saka Munsi and also uh, a question sort of Jai touched on, which is about we performing a piece which uh, is quite unique. And I can see extraordinary uses for archives. They are a great tool for human freedom, for reuses, for hybridization, for uh, reinventions, but uh, when it comes to reperformances of Pina Bausch's work herself, uh, I think there are questions that need to be raised. For example, uh, currently I think in Lille in France, uh, Nelken, Nelken, Nelken is going to be reperformed. I saw it in 2005 in Sadler's Wells in London and this kind of unique, uh, unspeakable melancholy of the piece had such an effect on my body and mind that I was mildly euphoric for two days <laughs> after seeing it. And uh, it may have to do with myself as well, okay, but it has no doubt a hell of a lot to do with that incredible quality of the performance and the incredible state in which the dancers were, which was facilitated by Pina Bausch, of course. And um, so my question is simply, when Pina Bausch works are reperformed, what care is taken into the unique process of choreography? For example, in Palermo, Palermo, here's a wonderful new French book by Claudia Palazzola about um, the historiography of the performance of Palermo, Palermo. I really recommend it to everyone. Um, but when one sees that there was real great research done as part of the process of the whole company going into a city, that was also a city with a particular imaginary in the European world. It had to get it right. At the same time, it extracted materials which were had the freedom of artistic creation. There was a load of improvisation going on. And then a miracle happens, which is Palermo, Palermo. Mm -hmm. How on earth can such pieces be reperformed and according to which criteria of authenticity in finding perhaps a new way of fresh life into a new performance because it cannot be a mimicry of mm -hmm. this incredible thing. And occasionally I see uh, performances or extracts on YouTube of Nelken or other things which are later than the original performances and somehow it comes across as more lifeless to me. I know it's not a thing archives can get to grips with, but mm -hmm. it raises the question, of course, of the limits of archives, 
which have been addressed right at the start, mm -hmm. but it may also raise the question of can archives also take these humane intangible dimensions more into account? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a really complex and huge uh, theme you're working, you're, you're talking. Um, uh, I agree with you with the mimicry sometimes. Uh, it's a really complex and fine line uh, that makes a piece sometimes like this. Uh, but if you look, for example, Palermo, uh, you, you have a, a big time with the original cast. And after come new dancer because the company is a living organism. And for example, Jan Minarik uh, is a day is not in the company anymore and it's really strong. They come somebody else working with Pina and Pina in a way could integrate this color in, uh, in the talk, uh, in, the, in the piece. And now Pina is not there anymore. So it means another way to approach the work. But I think the stagers are doing their best to, to, to find, and that's the question I, I, I was talking about with the, the, in the future, to, to have a seat and think about the piece and what's important in a piece, and the emotion, the, the personality of the people. Where can a, a role within a piece evolve, evolve to make the piece uh, still going uh, forward. So that's a, a huge thematic and which piece, for example, are not relevant anymore for X or y, y reason, you know? But that's a question I think it's strong by Tanz Theater, strong not only in the archive, but in the Pina Bausch Foundation. So, because as I said at the beginning, uh, one of our motto is to bring the work in the future, but how you do that? How you do that being respect, respectful for the work that has been done, but respectful enough to change it or yeah. also. And maybe, Ricardo, I know you're there. So if you want to add something, please feel free. Huh? Okay. Um, uh, I if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, hello, Marcus, nice to see you here. Um, I think your, your question also goes with the, with the question of the performance itself uh, uh, as well. There, is, there are limits to what, what an archive can, to what these documents can, can show and, and to, uh, to what we can, we can um, document, and even I, when as I, I, I make interviews with the people and uh, and try to uh, gather their their recollections or their analysis today of what happened before. But there is one thing that is uh, is paramount to this work, which is is still this this transmission from one person to another, uh, a kind of culture that that is that that that's created within those uh, the the rehearsal space, the rehearsal space in Wuppertal, or or other rehearsal space now uh, where this culture is being taken, say, to to rehearsals in in Senegal, and. Um, some dancers uh, captured that very fast, and, and and you see that dancers completely bloom and 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 become a very akin to this work. And some others uh, take a long longer time, but this this transmission will still, as you as you Marcus say, uh, as as uh, authentic uh, only within this 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 uh, culture of work and that means it, it's it's truly from one person to another and when we talk about re, uh, uh, reconstructions which we have other colleagues doing with work with Mary Vigman and trying to piece out out of pictures or of recollections or of little snippets of a of, of video um, that also means that they 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 tapping into their memory of those cultures and uh, 
and, and stays with with the human and we stayed with artistry so that that would be my my view on on a question like that we have one last question a second question from Sparnamalya ganesh so Sparnamalya, if you're here you can yeah direct it. yes hi um, thank you very much for this, um, I think, brilliant presentation, a very thought-provoking session indeed. Um, my question, I mean, I have two short questions. The first is, um, we all know that the Jacob Spillow um, archives are also substantial um, works. And um, I want to understand, I know that, you know, the, the, the format that you have used, I mean, the, the event cataloging, the networking of data is, um, is very unique and uh, indeed, um, I think, pioneering in its, in its own way. Um, can you sort of elaborate on how do you see as an archivist the, the sort of difference in the way um, one can approach these two archives, you know, vis-a-vis -vis one to the other? The other question is slightly sort of more um, uh, theoretical. Uh, this was touched upon a little bit earlier about how these, the archive itself is sort of this uh, connection between the past and the future. Uh, but I think we should also uh, take into account the fact that the archive is in fact also in the present. So it is this vestibule, but it's not just merely sort of dragging the past uh, into this present and taking it on to the future. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, the archives, um, and I think uh, uh, Professor Sundar touched upon this earlier in, in his opening remarks, um, it does produce new meanings, the archive itself. So in the context of speaking of the limitations of an archive, which we just touched upon just now, um, what are these new meanings and how, how do we see these productions of new meanings as new cultural productions, as opposed to seeing them as a sort of a repository of um, a past cultural memory or a series of cultural memories or uh, collective memories. Um, and how would that, and how would an archivist from your perspective um, guide say researchers or artists who access these archives to also temper their interpretations based on those limitations and, um, and the fact that the archive itself is the new cultural production. Thank you. Maybe for your first question, could you Sorry, elaborate? Just to, uh, intervene here quickly. We'll take this as the last question. So you can use this to sum up the thing. And then, so, you know, uh, we'll have a break soon after this. Yes, I, I had a question about uh, Jacob's Pillow archives. Could you elaborate what was your question? Uh, putting oh, this no, no, I, are you asking me? Yes, yes. Oh yeah, no, uh, what I meant is, I mean, what kind of uh, archival practices do you see as different from theirs to yours? Of course, I know that you're using an entirely new framework, but other than that, um, how do you see from the perspective of both the archivist as well as those who ac access those archives, researchers and others? Okay, because I'm not specialist for the, from the uh, Jacob Spillo archive. I know we had a few contacts with them for some project because they have some information about the time with Pina and Jean Sebron uh, and Lutz Förster also was in contact with them. So we have in a way, it's like a friend of a friend. Uh, it's connected in a way. Um, for the, for the, your, what you said about the present, uh, of course, it's a component. Uh, what we are doing now, it's completely different from what we were doing 10 years ago also, uh, in, uh, in the way we go with the material and what we add to it. But I think we are leaving traces uh, of what we are doing, uh, who is doing what. And, and some of the te technique, um, From, uh, from link data that we'll have to, we would like to add is to have the possibility that what we are saying, I mean, uh, my team now, uh, the dancers stays in the archives that every, every voice is welcome to, in the archives. So there is not, 
we are not trying to ban the archive, but of course, working on it, we will we leave traces. Uh, we make some choice, and we are trying to have it. Maybe not on the website, but for us, uh, traces of that. So, what's what was a document where Pina said it's a good one, uh, or it's uh, Benedict Billet who wrote a good performance because I heard it from Pina. When we talk with the dancer, they said, "Ah, to me that was a good a good performance. I remember this performance." So we we try to have this trace in the archive, if. We succeed every time, I don't know. Uh, yes, maybe we, we put some colors on, on some material, but I think, I think that's, a, that's in every archive a bit the same. Uh, we are trying anyway. I don't know if it answers what your question. Um, yeah, I mean, these are very large questions and these are very important questions. And I hope these are questions which we will as a community think about and develop responses. I want to thank both Ismail and Julian for this wonderful presentation and all our organizationists. And um, we are slightly running out of time, so I'm sorry to have to stop this here. But the next session with Rusha Nangia, which is also a very fascinating session on a different type of archiving, will uh, allow us to phrase these questions um, after her talk and expand on this conversation more. So with, um, we're really grateful for both of you taking your time and presenting your deep and complex work. And we hope to hear more about this work as in the days to come. Thank you so much. And we will now take a five minute break. Uh, tea and coffee will be served here. And then uh, we'll then invite Ushan Angir to join us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for so inviting us. Thank you. It was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
welcome back um we are um, sorry to start this a few minutes late and we are very thankful to shanangya for her patience it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce shanangya a person whom many of us have seen in uh, have seen her performances um, it's a really remarkable performance if you haven't seen her of course in action and um, she's a very eminent practitioner of the ancient sanskrit theater art forms of nangiyar kootu and kudiyattam she trained in kudiyattam under ammanur madhav chakiyar and is only disciple to have learned the art from him to the fullest extent she is also very active not just in performance but in various pedagogic uh, uh, practices and we are indeed very fortunate that she has uh, taken the time and trouble to join us today um although she is not with us in the physical domain which it would have happened in another context we are still very happy that she is able to join us online um if um, if usha is ready we will i will request her to give a presentation Hello, Usha. Please start. Yeah. Sorry, Kulu. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Sorry. good evening everyone archiving art performances is a promise towards guarding it against the test of time and preserving it by means of the available technology and this activity i believe is as relevant as staging the art i would be talking on the specific aspect specially provided the fact that i myself is a performer of kutta and kudiyattam and i would love to share my thoughts on the same a small introdu introduction about kutta and kudiyattam i wish to share with you uh, let me begin with an overview of kutta and kudiyattam kudiyattam is an ancient and well ordained ensemble and performative adaptation of of sanskrit rupakas kutta is an art form related to kudiyattam kutta unlike kudiyattam follows a monologue form in kudiyattam men perform male characters and women perform respective female characters and they together depict or perform an occasion or a story that and therefore the term kudiyattam which is performing together both kutta and kudiyattam resonates a continued cultural tradition and its lineages apart from being mere art forms having been denoted by malayalam word which convey its plain meaning such as kutta kudiyattam these two however is part of the longer tradition of sanskrit theater performances centered around temples and a patron by the temple vicinities the beginning is often traced back to vedic period and was sustained by the art practices and rituals that existed 
The theme of the performance is therefore mostly the tales of Purana characters and the performance progresses by enacting in minutest detail the mental and worldly effects of the characters in the act. This theater tradition is rooted in its strictest vocabulary and ways of practices and training and ritualistic enactments and strict guidelines that needs to be followed in its staging. The performance is distinctively characterized by the body language, its posture and spatial extents and resa. The performative space is an ensemble of the attires, apinaya, gestures of expressions and vadyas, the percussions or the accompanying instruments and underlined by the sahitya, literary context of the play enacted. Then uh, I'm going to say about the documentation project. Shri Krishna Charitam Manyarkut complete. The aim is, I have taken up the project of documenting Shri Krishna Charitam Manyarkut complete beyond being a digital record of the Kuta. It is conceived as a uh, repository with distinctive focus on the constitutive and performative uh, nuances of the act, namely the literature, the specificity of enactment, the inimitable practices followed, the ceremonial facets involved, as well as the detailed enactment that get features. Alongside being a unique experience for the art enthusiasts, this is also intended to be resourceful database for learners of Kuta Kudiyatam and researchers of the art form. Uh, I wish to share with you why I am selected Sri Krishna Charitam for documentation and what is the importance of that and historic, a small historical background and relevance. The presentation of Sri Krishna Charitam Manyar Kuta is connected to the place Subhadra Dhananjayam of Kulashekhara Varman of 9th or 10th century common era. The literature to the Kutta comprises of 217 shlokas portraying the stories of Krishna. The Atta Pragaram means acting manual and certain temple ins inscriptions testimony that Sri Krishna Charitam Manyarkut complete used to be performed in the past. As Kudiyatam performances employ men as portraying male characters and women as performing female characters, men were trained for the art form by training them, say, Anguli Yangam for Abhinaya training and Mandrangam for imparting vocal training. Similarly, the woman section were taught Sri Krishna Charitam as part of their training. That was their curricula. Sri Krishna Charitam Nanyarkut was not employed for training alone, but also in their debut performance or as part of the Adiyandira Kuta in temples. Adiyandira Kuta means annual ritual performance of Kuta Kudiyatam in temples. The Atta Pragaram of the Sri Krishna Charitam Sampurnam complete is the greatest evidence that it used to be performed and taught completely. But over the course of time, Sampurnam performances did not thrive and most temples witnessed abridged or narrowed versions of Sri Krishna Charitam performances. It is after centuries of remaining in dark and underperformed that it comes back to stage as Sambur Navataranam, complete performance in the period 1980 to 90 at Ammanur Chachuchakyar Smaraka Gurugulam. Guru Ammanur revived the 
entire Sri Krishna Charitam Mangyarkuta with Venuji and Nirmala Panikya supporting the endeavor. Guru Ammanur started teaching Sri Krishna Charitam Sampurnam at the Gurugulam and with great honor, I would share that I had the privilege and blessing to stage Sri Krishna Charitam Mangyarkuta post its revival. This even gets to be marked as an important milestone in the history of the art form. This has imparted to the women folk engaged in the art new focus and energy. With the Nanyarkut performances back on the main avenue, the women practitioners gained the courage to establish themselves relentlessly in the practices of the art form. Following suit numerous nirvahanas, nirvahanas means the flashback of the female characters uh, got to be performed with the inputs from such creative and dedicated practitioners and accompanying artists, Nangyar Kuta re-established itself in a space parallel to Kudiyatam. It's thus Sri Krishna Charitam Nangyar Kuta and its revival and performance that has preserved the world's world only thriving Ekaharya monologue, woman theater tradition. I performed three times the complete round of Nanyar Kuta on stage. Then the, uh, in the fourth step, I taught the students this uh, particular Nanyar Kuta and this, the uh, fifth round I am going on now for the documentation. Being of such relevance, Sri Krishna Charitam complete earns on its own right and might to be documented and be made available forever, especially to the future generation. And I wanted to do my part. And that in short is the impetus to the documentation process. The documentation entirely would span 70, 75 hours and is divided into 35 episodes. A team of 10 practitioners and enthusiasts are the ones making it happen. Now our documentation already 15 episodes finished. Then uh, COVID-19 has literally stalled the whole world in its onset and post the shock we have witnessed the world opening itself into a digital world. The ordinary life has suddenly shifted into the digital world and people could not but stamp their presence in the digital space. And this shift or a change of focus had left me pondering and I would like to list down that which I found rather interesting about it all and pushed me into the idea of talking up the documentation process. Uh, the first one is, I think, that a digital record is one that is forever. It won't generally uh, wither away in time. And the second, the shift in the attitude of the new generation or the upcoming generation and the shift that gets reflected as a result to the art form itself. A small example is um, <clears throat> normally in this art form, we follow more Natya Dharmi. Natya Dharmi means with strict rules and regulations, we, we uh, have to uh, act. Uh, one example, uh, if we want to take something, pot or something from the down on the floor, uh, nowadays we can see on stage many, many of the artists just go and bending and taking that very normal way doing. But in Kudiyatam, normally it has its own physical presence. It's a strict, uh, that, is, that is very important in this. The structure of the body is very important. So just going down with chopped uh, legs like that. That is more important. These 
all things, small, small things totally changed now that we can see on the new um, performances. Then the third, I thought the question of the uh, sustenance of an art form, particularly without succumbing to any compromises. And the uh, fourth, the happenings, both external and internal, the external and internal frame, that is also very important in uh, this type of art forms. Then the fifth, I thought, formation of new characters, means Kathapatra Srishtigal, and their deliberations. Um, I think a small portion, I think I can share now for you uh, from our documentation work. Mm, please. The volume is very low, and the the um, uh, Usha, the screen is stuck. Maybe you could yourself show instead of playing the thing. Maybe I have a feeling video is getting stuck for us. I don't know whether it is true. Nama Mathu is the same for everybody. Yes, yes, it is stuck. What we do? Usha, that maybe the internet is a little unstable, maybe. So, okay, um, okay. some. Uh, maybe um, uh, some of the points you wish to share, maybe you could, uh, you, if you don't mind, you could demonstrate yourself. Uh, maybe that would be easier. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, what we explained is about its uh, the chittagal and chatangugal. It is uh, that is inevitable in this for the uh, structure of the performances because uh, something uh, in front front of the performance when we start that time it's an inevitable thing for actual dance or ritual salutations or some that is if like this some salutations like this and keeping like this and some exercises of the eyes like this normally we don't know what for we are doing this but this is inevitable for this nirvahana portions. But we have incorrect portions we getting with that. Then uh, some, uh, the next is about new characters, formation of new characters. Normally in Atapragaram, sometimes just saying about that. One character, he comes and says to another one, and for an example, one uh, character called Upananda, he is coming to say, Nanda Gopa, uh, he, uh, in uh, Ambadi, so many problems happen now, uh, then the kids are not safe, so we want to shift to Vrindavana. 
so the particular person upananda we don't know what is the uh, uh, speciality of that per person and all then these type of characters we can elaborate uh, with a wide reading and all from bhagavata or garga samhita or narayaniya like that we can collect so many things about them then we can elaborate the uh, portions that is very important in these type of art forms because we don't want to change the outer frame we want to change inner how to elaborate the uh, characters how to explain their mind their thoughts like that then Uh, one another thing is how the new age influences and uh, communicates with such traditional art forms how would they get added to such art forms uh, can i try once more one portion um, i don't know it will stuck or not uh, just can i hello Yeah, yes usha you can try but i have a feeling the zoom itself probably is not supporting it very much anyway try maybe yeah usha Usha, Adhira is trying it. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. She is trying from another system. Sorry, it's not. Usha, maybe while she is trying, maybe I I would like to ask a question. You know, you were saying about um, the inner expression, the inner the uh, uh, because you are probably bound by the external uh, kind of um, uh, restrictions, which is a beautiful restriction to uh, which gives you in a way freedom. Um, the what are the what are the inner kind of changes? you would bring about in um, and uh, can you can you show some examples as to how that would be hello uh, could, could, could you hear what i was asking please please i'll i'll say again um so you were saying that um, the because of the strict structures of the form itself uh, you don't want to change the outer um expression of the form the technique of enacting and everything but internally the inner landscape you were saying you can actually take some freedom to maybe in, incorporate some of the contemporary experiences as a woman maybe is that true and if so how would yeah. you do that yeah 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 uh, can i can i speak in malayalam jayata uh, yes yes speak in malayalam okay. i'll try to can translate Okay. 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 If uh, in the inner right, um, katha patra ngale sri shtikya. Um, adine kuru channel parne. Um, bahya maaya ma chengala da idhar ande tarathilu lla internal frame and the external frame namku kudiya tarathilu kana. External frame means totally technical. ടെക്നിക്കൽ ഫ്രെയിം ആണ് മുദ്രയായാലും ഭാവായാലും ബോഡി ആയാലും ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ടെക്നിക്കൽ ഫ്രെയിം ബട്ട് ഇന്റേണൽ ഐ തിങ്ക് ഇറ്റ് ഗ്രോസ് അത് വളരും അത് വി ക്യാൻ എനി വേ എനി കണ്ടംപററി ആയിരിക്കാം എന്തായാലും അത് വി ക്യാൻ നമുക്ക് വ്യാഖ്യാനിക്കാം എത്ര വേണമെങ്കിൽ കഥാപാത്രത്തിന് there are two frame framework as far as she is concerned 
one is the external framework of the technique and the body language and everything but the, the other one is internal framework which is actually how the dealings or the thought processes of the mind itself and there she takes freedom and she can incorporate other influences and then find an external language but when is there any conflict when you change the internal and how how do you internal um, uh, deliberations then how do you find the external equivalent language because that process you have to do it there there is no tradition for that there is no other training for it no yes appa da engane cheya usha um ipa contemporary world il jeevikana var enna aanallo nammale purana kathapaathrangale cheyunu avarade ചിന്തകളെ ബട്ട് വി ഡോ നോ അവരെങ്ങനെയാണ് എന്നുള്ളത് നമുക്കറിയില്ല അപ്പൊ ഒരിക്കലും ഇമിറ്റേഷൻ അല്ല അനുകരിക്കുകയല്ല അവരെങ്ങനെയായിരിക്കും എന്ന് നമ്മളുടെ ഒരു കൾച്ചറൽ പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ ഒരു ബാക്ക്ഗ്രൗണ്ടിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ടാണ് നമ്മൾ അതിനെ കണ്ടെത്തുന്നത് ഈ കഥാപാത്രങ്ങൾ എങ്ങനെ ആയിരിക്കണം അത് എങ്ങനെ അവരെ അവരുടെ ചിന്തകളെ നമുക്ക് വ്യാഖ്യാനിക്കാം ടെക്സ്റ്റ് നമുക്ക് ബേസ് ആണ് അതിൽ നിന്ന് വിട്ടു പോവാൻ പറ്റില്ല ബട്ട് വി ക്യാൻ ഒരു ഒരു ഉദാഹരണം ഇപ്പൊ ഈ വൃന്ദാവനത്തിലേക്ക് ഇവരെല്ലാവരും കൂടി പോകുന്ന ഒരു ഭാഗമുണ്ട് എല്ലാവരും കൂടി പോകുമ്പോ അവര് പറ ആട്ടപ്രകാരത്തിൽ ആക്ടിംഗ് മാനുവലിൽ പറഞ്ഞിട്ടുള്ളത് ജസ്റ്റ് ദേ ഓൾ ആർ ഗോയിങ് വിത്ത് ദ ഹോൾ തിങ്സ് അവിടുന്ന് കളകളുടെ കഴുത്തിൽ കെട്ടി വണ്ടികളിൽ നിറച്ച് എല്ലാവരും പോകുന്നു അത്രേ പറയുന്നുള്ളൂ അതിൽ ബട്ട് വി ക്യാൻ വൺ സെക്കൻഡ് ഉഷ അപ് ടു ദാറ്റ് ലെറ്റ് മി ട്രാൻസ്ലേറ്റ് ബട്ട് ഉഷ സേസ് ഇസ് ആക്ച്വലി ഫ്രം ഹെർ പെർസ്പെക്റ്റീവ് ഫ്രം ആസ് എ കൺടെംപററി വുമൻ ഷീ ടേക്സ് ഓൾ ദ എക്സ്പീരിയൻസസ് ഓഫ് ലിവിങ് ടുഡേ ബട്ട് ദൻ ട്രൈ ടു ഇമാജിൻ ഹൗ ദ ക്യാരക്ടർസ് ആർ ഫ്രെയിംഡ് ഇൻ ദ ഇൻ ദ ട്രഡീഷൻ ആൻഡ് ദൻ uh try to interpret in her own way so the text has got certain parameters and the form itself has got some certain parameters within which she tries to uh find uh, new ways of incorporating her own language so for example she was saying when um, the the from uh, vrindavanam to where, where where was it uh, uh, ambadi to vrindavanam uh, from um, ambadi to vrindavanam in the story of krishna there is um, this uh, journey from ambadi to vrindavanam uh, and then uh, she was saying uh, you know they put up put uh, things in the bullock cart and uh, setting off to journey but she was saying this is an example she could probably explain how she would uh, uh, depart from the actual traditional methodology over to usha usha parani yeah and and in putana moksham also i think in putana yeah and then connect it uh, with with the archive yeah idu cheedite so ipo kanikkanengil adu usheda archiving strategy il engane varunnu nalladhe kudi parayanengil nalladhu okay okay adu adu or space aanu engine classical formulaile ഡീറ്റെയിൽഡ് ആക്ടിങ് ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതിനുള്ള ഒരു സ്പേസ് ആണ് അത്തരം സ്ഥലങ്ങൾ കാരണം നമ്മൾ ട്രഡീഷണലി കാണുമ്പോ വി ഹാവ് സം സെർട്ടൈൻ പാർട്സ് അതിങ്ങനെ റിപ്പീറ്റ് ചെയ്യാണ് കൂടിയാട്ടത്തില് കാമശരം കൊള്ളുക അല്ലെങ്കിൽ വനവർണ്ണന ചെയ്യുക അല്ലെങ്കിൽ പർവ്വത വർണ്ണന ചെയ്യുക അതിങ്ങനെ റിപ്പീറ്റഡ് ആണ് എല്ലാത്തിലും അതല്ലാതെ പുതിയ അഭിനയ ഭാഗങ്ങൾ എങ്ങനെ കണ്ടെത്താൻ സാധിക്കുന്നു അത് ഏതൊക്കെ സ്പേസിൽ നിന്നുകൊണ്ടാണ് നമുക്ക് കിട്ടുക മനോധർമ്മത്തിന് ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനമാണ് അത് അപ്പൊ ഏ ഏതൊക്കെ പോയിന്റിൽ നിന്നാണ് നമുക്ക് അത്തരം ഡീറ്റെയിൽഡ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള അഭിനയങ്ങളെ ഉണ്ടാക്കാൻ സാധിക്കുക അപ്പൊ ഇനിയും ഈ ഇതിൽ ഇതുപോലെയുള്ള ധാരാളം സ്പേസസ് കാണാൻ പറ്റും അതിനൊരു ഹിന്റാണ് അത് context like when they enact um, the forest or um, the uh, or love struck person or um, uh, uh, or a journey or whatever uh, but that is from that particular perspective but she said she has a when she looks at 
from her vantage point, from her spatial orientation of a woman today, she has the possibility to incorporate uh, some of her experiences into uh, these, uh, these um, the kind of depiction, uh, maybe elaborate with the more details of from her own experience. But how does that reflect in your um, in your archive? You you try to do any specific ways of archiving? Uh, yes, we we other um, uh, a new new part new Abhinaya part already we created with special movements or something like that. Adu create idu angane adu suuchichu ekiyana. But I think. The uh, next, someone see that at least they can understand how we elaborate some portions like this. Uru, Edengilu Bhagatununa, and the Gilu Hindi Kitial, Engine, Itterem Abhinea Bhagangal Pududait Undaka. The classical forms in Pradhana, classical forms of Rikilum uh, outer world in Oda Laparena, inner Anaparena. Uh, this is a very important point what she's saying. She's saying in the classical forms, it is not about the external world as an artist addresses, much more about an internal world, conversation with the internal world. So she, by in her own meditation or contemplation, she she kind of finds these new languages or new idioms or new metaphors, and then try to articulate that. And this is probably will be important in people, many people who are trying to do uh, classical forms. And I think uh, we have Priya here, a very eminent singer. Maybe she might have something to add, because I think compositions are set maybe but the interpretations might differ maybe i don't know Usha, whether yes, i'm really translating one, the way you wish to i don't know yes, yes, yes. Uh, one small example also about the character how to elaborate a character uh, that is uh, putana moksham in putana moksham in text not say anything just putana uh, she is uh, uh, killing uh, babies, they, she come and take the babies already killed like that. Only that much about Putana it describes. But Adila Balakhadini Putana, a word that we can elaborate. Pinne Putana Engene la Striyan Namalk full freedom on actor Engene Chayanam in the love. Now Munu Taratil Putana is from Ikar. On the Pudana Valare Damanas Daman Adai the Rakshasi Aitler is three Aita, Adi Modale, Porum, Hangara de Shetilla, Krura Karmangalachi in the three Aitur performance. Ada Ladan Allera Mayait, Kamsanda at Nagunda, Taniki Kutila Lake or Lendi Verunu, in the love Atigat Night La Dukam, and if a Vikinur is three, as three Tanda Makalach in the Kiana, you could take a carnival. Our dealer. Uristrida Manasumaiti performance name Uruan would not to Kunduoga. Adu Kuda, the Porchi philosophical veiler, uh, comes under the Tishan Island and Ikimaranamana, he could teeter the Tishan Island and Ikimaranan. Adu Kutimai are renewed under Pripratega, Manasigavas Hail Laputanating and Engana Venangil Putanada Manasine, Namaka, Yakia and Ikam are in it. One second. Uh, she is elaborating about Putana Moksham in which Putana is uh, depicted as a child killer. So she says she has uh, enacted that in three different ways. One is uh, she is a demoness from the beginning, the word go. She is an angry woman and uh, the, the anger is for, forefront throughout the performance. Second one is uh, she is um, kind of um, uh, sad a little bit in, in, in her mind because of a come the king comes us uh, on his orders, she is bound or she's forced to kill these children. Maybe she doesn't want to. So that dilemma. Third one is a slightly philosophical one where she says, 
uh, if I go to Kamsa, there also I will face death. But if I go to the, these kids, they are also going to grow up to kill me. So there also I have death. So in this deliberation, her characters can be explored in in this kind of way. So th from in the in the text in the libretto, there is only one word. Say uh, the child killing Putana. That's only the word. But then she enacts it in a deliberation in in detailed way. This way. This is one important thing about the acting acting technique of Kudiyattam, where even a blossoming of a flower or a glance of a woman, all of these are explained and enacted too detailed. Sometimes just one line can go for half an hour or more. So that uh, that's what, that concentration is what she's referring to. Over to you, Shah. We may okay. have to conclude soon. So just come to your, um, towards the last two or three points. Yes, yes. And the ne next point, what I think is, the criteria of uh, impromptu acting. Because Manodharmam etrayavam, adinda manadanda vendam. Adaru vailiya chodhyana innata generation da munbile. Because I think enikya enda munbatta thalamurayda abhinayam kaana anima riyanam saadhi chitin. Ad adutturi generation ad kaanan patat thunda im manodharmam etrayavam kudiyatatile kudiyatam bolollo re kalayi le nalla da valiye re chodhi jinna iti pooran ka dakkar. So adu gudi i archiving le kudala iti jaya shuddhi ke nor samhavana etra tolam manodharmam ala manodharmatin de manadanda mandan and pagarnata man manodharmam namkariyam the main thing. Kudiatatin the Kudiata Binet in the Kadalan, either end Manodharma Binea and Pagarnat. Up either endum Enganasu Chichika Igaidium Cheyanam in the leather, he archives look Udal Shadichetana Namala Chedundi. What Rusha says is in the archive, she is paying special attention to two devices, two devices that that has been employed in Kudiyata. One is Pagarnatam or enactment of different characters by the same person. The other one is Manotharmam or impromptu performance or improvisation according to your mental imagination. So these two things uh, she feels in the uh, current generation or the younger generations, they uh, do not have that um, time sense, unfortunately, to to stay on one idea. And she said she, somebody like her had the fortune of uh, witnessing those things uh, from the great masters. And uh, in today's generation, they probably don't get that. And the speed of the time, of course, also play a role. So the 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 uh, uh, her attempt is to maybe uh, con uh, maybe. Um, archive some of these aspects maybe for the generations to come. I think this this is an interesting thing, probably cuts across many uh, physical disciplines or many performative disciplines. The lack of time to deliberate or the lack of time to meditate on certain ideas to develop an in-depth kind of um, uh, artistic expression. Uh, maybe Usham, what is the time? I, do, I have to look at the time. Yeah, so last point, Rishabh, we have to conclude this one. Yes, yes. Okay, then um, just last point is Natya Dharmi and Loka Dharmi of this. Because this uh, these two important consecutive elements, that is uh, Pagarnatam and Manodharma Abhinayam, Either random Natya Tharmila Umbora or you performance Udata Maya level lake Pogu. There are much either than a Tevu Mosha Maitla dealer performance name would not own to an image. Udiatam Bolela performance. Other other Nadande Kalivum Buddhim Yukdim Ella Mansarichana e Idinde and Dindayum Ubayoga. Other Kritimaita, 
ബോധ്യപ്പെടുന്ന രീതിയിലായിരിക്കണം ഈ ആർക്കൈവ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ശ്രദ്ധ വച്ചിട്ടാണ് അത് നമ്മൾ മുഴുവൻ ഇപ്പോ ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കണത് ഒരു ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ കൂടി ക്ലാരിഫൈ ചെയ്യണം അതായത് നാട്യധർമ്മി എന്ന് പറയുമ്പോൾ സ്റ്റൈലൈസ്ഡ് എന്ന് പറയാറുണ്ട് ചിലപ്പോൾ അതിൽ കുറെ കൂടി കുറെ കൂടി അബ്സ്ട്രാക്ഷൻ ഉണ്ടോ അല്ലെ കുറെ കൂടി അങ്ങനെയാണോ എങ്ങനെയോ ഹൗ ഡു യു ഡിഫൈൻ ഇറ്റ് കുറച്ചുകൂടിയും അല്ല നാട്യധർമ്മിയാണ് ശരിക്കും കൂടിയാട്ടത്തിൽ അഭിനയം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അല്ല അത് ലോകധർമ്മി എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ഇതിനേക്കാളും കൂടുതൽ അബ്സ്ട്രാക്ഷൻ ഉണ്ടോ സ്റ്റൈലൈസേഷൻ ഉണ്ടോ എങ്ങനെയാ പറയുന്നത് അത് ഇന്നറാണ് കൂടുതൽ നാട്യധർമ്മിയിൽ ഭാവം വരുമ്പോ ഇന്നറാണ് കൂടുതൽ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ ലോകധർമ്മി ആവുമ്പോ പുറത്തേക്കല്ലേ ഇറ്റ് മീൻസ് കരയുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ഉറക്ക പൊട്ടി കരയുകയാണെങ്കിൽ അത് ലോകധർമ്മിയാണ് അത് കാണുമ്പോ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് നേരം മറിച്ച് വിങ്ങി നിറഞ്ഞു നിൽക്കുന്ന സങ്കട മുഖത്ത് വരുമ്പോ അത് പുറത്തേക്ക് ഒരു പരിധി വരെ പ്രകടിപ്പിക്കാതെ ഉള്ളിൽ നിറഞ്ഞു നിൽക്കുമ്പോ നമ്മളുടെ ശരീര അവയവങ്ങളിൽ തന്നെ പുറത്തേക്ക് വരുമല്ലോ അതായിരിക്കും കുറച്ചുകൂടി നാട്യധർമ്മിയെ ഉപമിക്കാൻ കുറച്ചുകൂടി നല്ലത് look at these two two main pillars loka dharmi and natya dharmi enactment in kudiyattam and kudiyattam particularly emphasizes on the natya dharmi uh, for people who are not familiar with this is a more stylized more abstracted kind of um, uh, uh, performance uh, style is called natya dharmi in um, indian uh, indian performance traditions so she says uh, an example if somebody cries very loudly and very visibly that is probably logadharmi more worldly kind of enactment the natyadharmi uh, is much more internal which uh, you are not showing really crying but you are about to cry you are uh, almost uh, at the brim of it and then your physica- physicality changes that she feels is a bit more sublime you know in the concept of sublime is also when something is much bigger than you you tend to abstract to 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 denote something because the imagination of the audience also comes into play usha we may have to stop there now we have even just for a brief um, uh, question we have already r- r- run out of time priya you would like to say something okay i um, thank you very much usha as always it's uh, so lovely to listen to you although i didn't understand too much but uh, the you know the points you made were very important and i you know in a in a interesting sense i was trying to see what connects the first session where we did about pina bosch and the archiving questions around it and yours your attempts to um, you know do this archiving giving us a digital access to these performances right and you know at one level i can see that the stark difference in both actually illustrates the differences between traditional in some notion trying to archive the traditional as against archiving the contemporary you know and it's also captured not just in the fact that the technological um artifacts which are used are quite different i mean we saw in the case of pina bosch this whole idea of uh, data playing such an important role and uh, and it is not just that it's about the kinds of expressions it's about the kinds of languages which differ when we talk about this traditional and the contemporary in various ways and i think uh, at a, at the you know at a sublime level at a level below the performance of what we saw these questions are very important in particular what struck me was this your repeated attempt to talk about the internal something as very special to uh, this particular form of art means that the question of archiving of the internal which is what the last two questions of the pina bosch questions to came i mean you can show the materiality you can archive the materialities of various things but how, where do you show those kinds of influences on people the emotions it creates right that's what that is what marcus is talking about and in a sense your own um, you know bringing that point alerts us to this question of how does an archive deal with the internal and i think you know for me why i find it very interesting is and i just leave it here before we open it up for questions is that in both the cases i find one common element in spite of the differences and that common element is archive seems to do has to seems to have a function of knowledge in both cases you are producing 
a repository of knowledge. In your case, you are very clear that, you know, these things are getting lost. Now I produce it and keep it so people can see what kinds of practices were present, how we were doing the various performances and so on. And including in the Pina Bosch, and as we could see even in the discussions uh, about the um, archiving, it's not just a bringing together of various elements. It is categorized as, you know, Venkat was also asking about, I'm mean, pointing to that point. Even the categorization is a kind of a knowledge production. It's a kind of a structure of um, creating a knowledge structure within that archive. And in this sense, both of these um, archives are working towards a question of knowledge. And I, why I find that very fascinating is because historically art has always struggled with the question of knowledge. Performance of art is not about performance of knowing. Unlike a text which is communicating specific forms of knowledge, you had to come up with different notions of knowing and knowledge within art. And many artists and a lot of philosophy of art has dealt with this particular question. And if you ask an artist, what does what do I learn from there? What is the knowledge present in a, a contemporary dance performance of Artaklari? I mean, Jai would throw me out of this studio. He'd say, I'm not going to give you knowledge about something. I mean, other than the fact that you're all very good dancer. Knowledge is not the aim of this particular art performances. But an archive seems to be doing that. And to me, that raises the fundamental conflict because in the way we understand knowledge, it's not just about the fact that we can't represent the internal and the external. There is a difference in the way we understand knowledge itself, any theory of knowledge. And knowledge of the internal has always been the most difficult uh, theme within theories of knowledge, within the larger philosophical understanding of knowledge. So um, I, I'm just triggered. I mean, these, some of these thoughts are triggered when I was listening to you and trying to make sense of this whole session with Pina Bosch's and yours. And as, is, and, um, as Jay said, I mean, you have triggered many more thoughts and questions amongst all of us. Thank you so much for sharing this very, very important work with us. And I hope many people will be following the work you've been doing with these archiving. So I now open this out for any questions or comments any of you want to do um, and ask her uh, anything. And then I'll come back to um, you know, Winket and who is it? Jay and others. So Jay has had a say. Uh, any questions, any thoughts? Yeah, Rashmi. Yeah, you can uh, you get the mic. Hmm. Uh, I want to say hello to Urmi Mala. This is Rashmi Sani. I was hoping to see you here. I don't know if you can see us all, but anyway. Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, I was also trying to kind of understand what linked the first session with the second, and I struggled with it for a little while uh, until it opened up a lot of kind of you know creative possibilities and Sundar has kind of framed it wonderfully, opening out a whole Pandora's box, of course, which will take a lot of time to uh, discuss. Um, but it did actually make me wonder about, because, you know, I was also kind of uh, stretching myself to try and understand what is the connection between uh, this kind of very conventional, not conventional, uh, contemporary archive of the Pina Bosch um, thing that we heard about. And uh, the second uh, session, which seems to me uh, in the process of documentation, uh, quite far away yet from becoming what we conventionally or classically understand as an archive, because an archive is a retrospective act in some sense to which things keep getting added. And of course, Venkat will have a lot to say about this, but you know, it's, it's, it's a process that is made to some extent and then built upon all the time to become stronger. Whereas this, it seemed to me very interesting. Uh, it, it made me actually ask the question whether an archive is a form or is it an intent? I mean, is it possible to uh, look at the work that Ms. Nambiar is doing as an intentionality shared by an archivist or an archive uh, in some sense, whereas it is not yet quite an archive. So um, that, I mean, I mean, I'm just trying to you know, grapple with that because uh, it seems to me that at the moment her body is the archive, right? And uh, how does one then read different kinds of archives? Is it always something that, uh, you know, belongs, is bringing the past into the present in order to uh, catapult its 
possibilities into the future. So it, there's always an intentionality of possibilities, and that uh, really interests me um, because uh, you know it's. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you will have read this uh, really wonderful text called Ten Theses on the Archive by uh, Padma. Uh, and um, they talk of this, the, the, the reserve of the archive as holding possible value. Uh, and how do you think of something that is lying dormant in waiting to be pu you know, pulled out and then made into something else? So these are kind of random thoughts, but they were triggered by this kind of a requirement to connect session one with session two. So thank you for the time and patience. To the, uh, respond to this question, the larger question of would you want to make a distinction in documentation in a more traditional sense of the term we understand and archiving? Do you think it's useful to do that? Because one might say, um, you know, what Vishalangir is doing, like with many traditional art forms, there is a documentation process going on, digitization, whatever forms of it. And would you want to say that archiving is doing something more or some different type of specialization of documentation? Okay. Um, thanks for this question. Thanks for the session. I'm um, I'm overwhelmed to be honest. I do make a distinction. So coming back to what uh, Rashmi was also saying, I think we're at a point safe to say that the word archive is a big tent. There are there are many different kinds of archives, and it's perfectly fine, and they all you know should exist and thrive. Documenting, of course, comes from you know the Latin word I think to learn. So I think it's useful to sort of you know contextualize and think a little bit about what a learning space is. And of course, the, the, the hierarchical origins of the word archive is something that we should also consider. But I think um, my feeling is that the word archive and the verb archive, the noun and the verb, which I keep talking about, you know, the, the noun came much before the verb, um, is a space that can accommodate both. What, what Ushna is trying to do is just extraordinary stuff. Um, but it may perhaps never, unfortunately, capture the moment. Um, there are some workarounds, right? Uh, and I, so for instance, if, if, if the archive has other spaces, and this perhaps was also something in the Pina Bausch archive that they've looked at in the, the interviews that they've done with people who have spoken to Pina Bausch and who have memories of working with her. That is the space where I think these oral history interviews, where you sort of spend time reflecting. The, the, the physical document, you know, we have, the same thing happens at the archives at NCBS, which is a biology archive. We have so many documents looking at the history of, uh, you know, the study of smell and such. You know, we have lab protocols. I was yesterday looking at uh, cookbooks at the Smithsonian Archive, just looking at cookbook after cookbook. And my question is, how much of this, you know, if this is all that remained in the year 2050, um, you know, how much of this will be able to, will, will help me recreate uh, a particular recipe? or a particular lab process or a particular movement. And I think the in that moment, in, in the moment, you know, because every moment that we live in has the potential of entering an archive. Um, whether or not it enters the archive, including this moment that we're in, is 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 a consequence of various things. I call it luck, decision, circumstances, a variety of different things. But in that moment, there is, you know, what Rushas was rightly pointed out, there is the internal and the external. The external, you know, as a species, we've figured out how to sort of, you know, keep track of it in some ways. We've found tools, you know, although we haven't been able to do it for smell, we can do it for many other things. Um, but the internal, the way to do it is just, you know, for me, the, the way to keep things alive, perhaps is not restricted to the archive and it should never be. The, the way to keep things alive is process, you know, just keep doing it. You know, the, 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 the form that Usha is, you know, is, is a pioneer of, is a champion of, is, is not a form that depended on the archive. It depended on, it's, it's dependent on an ability to keep transferring knowledge. Um, and transfer of knowledge is, is a space that's independent of the archive, in my opinion. I mean, the archive can be a tool or a, a bystander or a helper or a nudger. Um, but that, that, you know, to keep things alive, to keep things thriving so that the moment, and the moment can be reimagined, recreated, I think is, is for me, is independent of the archive, and I, I hate to say this as an archivist. <laughs> we want to be complete, but we can't. Sorry, I, Mala, I think you had something to say. Yeah, I uh, am. I heard. Yeah, you're okay. heard. So okay. So uh, firstly, I really want to thank uh, Usha ji for what she's shared with us, and it also makes me uh, feel very. Uh, 
um, you know, very humbled by the way in which uh, an archive then kind of feels limited by the finite uh, quality that it achieves the moment it gets archived, something gets documented and archived. And the way in which this embodied repertoire can always be an ephemeral thing, but growing and changing. And like, like she's talking about the improvisational ma material that the storytelling itself gives the, the, the freedom to an artist where it can grow with different imaginations of different people, of different genders, of different classes, of different time, space, uh, different kinds of bodies. Which, which then can constantly evolve. But I think my greatest, uh, uh, I, I, I really actually feel very fascinated that she has actually created a space from which to start this imagination or to kind of carry on this imagination even further. So to create a kind of finite space from where there could be other ways of developing other imaginations, more story strands, more ways of uh, using different kinds of facial or uh, gestural imaginations. I feel that uh, in this case, uh, it's very different as Sundar was saying, as uh, Rashmi was saying, that the archives are very different, both com coming together of them actually make us uh, understand different kinds of ways in which archives could function and could leave something for uh, different kinds of availability in future. Thank you. Thank you, Urmala. Are there any comments from any of you here? Uh, so we have one question the from the yeah. online audience. Yeah. So the question is from Muragdev. My understanding is that historically, Kudiyatam has to be performed only by a certain family or ethnic group. That uh, is this still the case? That's the question. If so, surely it's even harder to keep it alive, and not only as an archive item. So that is the. This question is for Usha Nambia. Nambia yeah. Usha, it's a question for you. Are you there? Usha, uh, that question was for you. Unmute yourself. Yes, yes. yes. Not a certain family before, uh, I think 60 years before, uh, some certain families, only Chakyar Nambiar community, people do, but nowadays not. In anyone, anyone can learn and yeah. Sixty years before, only some is a kulatori like that, community profession like that in temples. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, that's the question. No more questions, sir. Not audible, not audible. No, no sound, sir. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Ushanangyar. As always, it's been a great learning experience. And I think, as what all our commentators have said, there are many other things we need to think through that are very important 
dimensions and the very act of archiving, which is becoming far more uh, visible these days, to really understand what is their role, not just in the preservation of art, but in various aspects surrounding that practice of that art. And I'm really uh, grateful to you for having taken the time and spent your time with us, trying to share some of this very important uh, work you're doing. So it's, a, it's been a great session, maybe tiring for all of you after two and a half hours. But I must thank all of you, both in the online, uh, people who are in the online and people who are here, for your patience and keeping the spirits up and thinking through these very difficult questions. So I want to thank all the speakers who have been with us today and all our other participants. And Venkat here and Jay who have been with me on the stage. And thank you so much for having raising these questions and for giving us a particular path for many of us who are involved in this, who are interested in this, students of Atakwadi and others, to continue to reflect on this in the future. Thank you so much. Jay. Um, I just want to say big thank you. Atakwadi India Biennial 2021-22 is funded by the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021 of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Goethe Institute, and other partners. We are hosting the biennial in partnership with the Goethe Institute, Maximula Pavan, Bangalore, Department of Tourism, Government of Karnataka, and the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. We thank all other partners, funders, supporters, artists, patrons, and above all, you, the viewers and audience, who are, who are supporting and turning up for all the events without fail. Now, this event is... Um, uh, technically managed by the Transmedia Technologies. Here, uh, I, I wouldn't remember everybody's name, but uh, Niranjan, Vishnu, Wilson, Bahadur, um, Farooq, Janak, Shamita, and um, Sonia. They are all part of the technical team. Uh, thank you all, for, uh, and Madhu at home, also working on this one. Now, uh, tomorrow we have two events, one at 4 p.m., uh, Sleeping Beauty, from the uh, from the award-winning Korean dance company, and at 7 p.m. we have the Indian cohort of young filmmakers, young dance choreographers and dancers who have made these films of very interesting subjects. So do join us online for that. And until then, wherever you are joining, a very good evening or good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And people who are here, please join us for a, some drinks and some bites to eat downstairs. <laughs>